Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In parts one through three of our Machiavelli of Westeros series, we discussed Tywin Lannister's early life, his skill as a battle commander when he put down the Tarbex and Reigns in a manner that he need never fear vengeance, and his successful tenure as Hand to the Mad King. Over time, Eris came to resent Tywin for his capabilities, and began undermining his every move and publicly shaming him whenever possible. He rudely rebuked Tywin's offer to betroth Cersei to Rhaegar, and likely even had relations with Tywin's wife Joanna at court, which we believe resulted in Tyrion's conception. After her death, Eris became convinced that Tywin was going to kill him, and would only meet with him when all seven of the Kingsguard were present. Tywin, having known Rhaegar since he was a child, likely saw in the young prince everything Eris was not. The two likely bonded over the disgrace both of their fathers brought upon their houses, and how these actions jeopardized their own inheritances. It's also important to remember that Eris's sadism also extended to his wife and Rhaegar's mother. As Jamie recalls wanting to stop him from doing brutal things to her during sex, which left her bruised and battered on more than one occasion. Having had enough of Eris's nonsense, Rhaegar and Tywin plotted to have him killed at Duskendale, and when that failed, they tried to peacefully remove him with an unofficial great council at Harrenhal. If it weren't for Rhaegar's unfortunate decisions at Harrenhal and in the Riverlands when he and Lyanna ran off together, Rhaegar and Tywin might have seen their plan come to fruition. However, as we all know, in the end, it was only Tywin who was left standing. Being a man that hedges his bets, Tywin placed himself in a position where no matter what the outcome was, he would be waiting in King's Landing to usher in a new king and see an end to the Mad King's reign. So, coming up in this video, we will be explaining a little bit about Machiavelli and his book, The Prince, drawing parallels to the character of Tywin Lannister, and why Tywin is a man made to play the Game of Thrones, and truly does loom as large as Casterly Rock. So, let's do this. Niccolo Machiavelli, born the son of a Florentine lawyer in 1469, was an Italian politician and philosopher who rose high and eventually became a strategic advisor to the Florentine Republic in the early 16th century. He is best known for writing one of the most famous books of all time, The Prince. Essentially, The Prince was a guidebook on how to acquire and use political power. Today, the term Machiavellian has become associated with certain characteristics and has been widely studied by scholars from various disciplines. Psychologists, in particular, have become increasingly fascinated with the ideals set forth in The Prince, going so far as to create tests to determine how closely someone's personality lines up with what would be considered the Machiavellian way. Machiavellian types are motivated by self-interest and are likely to be detached and willing to manipulate people and or circumstances for their benefit. One of the most noticeable characteristics of a Machiavellian type personality is that they are, or appear to be, completely devoid of emotion. Interested in learning how you would score on the Machiavelli personality test? Well, click the link in the About section below to find out. As a psychologist, I have taken it a few times and obviously had Dave take it when we first met. He scored quite high. Me, not so much. But anyways, let's get back to Tywin. So as we all know, Tywin issues severities so that he need never fear vengeance, and orders the children of Rhaegar killed. He then marries Cersei to Robert and secures his family's place at court. Ned despises him for this 
And when Robert tells him that he was going to foster Sweet Robin with Tywin, Ned thinks he would sooner entrust a child to a pit viper than Tywin Lannister. This definitely has some merit, because Tywin might be the greatest political force in all of Westeros, but his fathering skills could definitely use some improvement. In a Game of Thrones, Ned, in his position as Hand, holds court for Robert while he is out hunting. A group of petitioners from the Riverlands come and tell him that their towns, fields, and businesses have been savagely butchered and burned by a giant in the Black of Night. Everyone there knows that they are clearly referring to the mountain, and Ned immediately knows that it was Tywin who sent these men as retribution for Catelyn seizing Tyrion. He then thinks that it was perfectly played by Tywin, who sent the mountain and his men there dressed like common brigands, so if the Tullys were dumb enough to hit back without asking the king for his leave to do so, Tywin could claim that the Tullys broke the king's peace not him. Ned's next thought, however, is the one that really got our attention. He thinks, Tywin Lannister was as much a fox as a lion, which is almost directly taken from Machiavelli's The Prince, where he declared, quote, the lion cannot protect himself from traps, and the fox cannot defend himself from wolves. One must therefore be a fox to recognize traps, and a lion to frighten the wolves. This quote from the prince not only seems to perfectly describe Tywin, but it also appears to be the inspiration for the entirety of House Lannister, as Lan the Clever was rumored to be a bastard of House Florent, whose sigil just so happens to be a fox, and he created House Lannister, whose sigil is obviously a lion. It also appears to be perfectly symbolic of the struggle that is about to take place in our story between the Starks, or the Wolves, and the Lannisters, or the Lions. After being taken captive by the Stoneheart, Tyrion thinks that Tywin couldn't care a fig about him, but tolerated no slights on the honor of his house. This lines up with Machiavelli's thoughts about men like Tywin, whose, quote, enormous reputation always protected him from the hatred people might otherwise have felt as a result of his pillage and violence. A slight on his family that went unanswered would diminish the reputation that he skillfully uses to keep his family's position secure. Knowing that Ned is not the type of man who would send someone else to do his killing for him, Tywin decided to send the Mountain and his men to attack the Riverlands, hoping to lure Ned into an ambush. This is not at all surprising, as everyone should have learned from his treatment of the Tarbex and Reigns. Tywin is not a man who is known for simply getting even when the honor of his house is at stake. He has repeatedly made it known that if you do anything that diminishes the status of House Lannister, he will stop at nothing and use it as an opportunity to showcase just how severe the consequences will be. Slaughtering Ned and his men would have sent a clear message to all. If Tywin would order the massacre of one of the most powerful lords in the realm, who also happened to be the Hand of the King as retribution for seizing a member of his family that he publicly despises, just imagine what he would do to someone that decided it wise to mess with a member of his family that he actually cares about. Unfortunately for Tywin, while he was setting the trap, Jaime, who was unaware of his father's plan, attacked Ned and his men in the streets of King's Landing, which resulted in Ned's leg getting shattered, making him unable to go deal with the mountain himself. Ned was forced to send Beric Dondarrion, Thoris of Myr, Lothar Mallory and Gladden Wild, as well as about 80 other men, including 20 of his own, to go deal with the mountain in his stead. When Beric and his men crossed the Red Fork at the Mummer's Ford, they found themselves surrounded on all sides by the mountain's men, resulting in the massacre Tywin had planned for Ned, but Ned wasn't there. Tywin's actions following Tyrion's capture also fulfill another lesson of Machiavelli's The Prince, 
which is that Taiwan knows that there is no avoiding war. It can only be postponed to the advantage of others. By striking the Riverlands immediately following Tyrion's capture, it left no time for the Starks or the Tullys to prepare for war, therefore giving him the upper hand. Following the massacre at the Mummer's Ford, Tywin divides his forces, leading one army himself and Jaime leading the other. Jaime shattered the hastily assembled forces of the Riverlands at the Golden Tooth, capturing Edmure Tully and chased the remaining forces of the Riverlands back to Riverrun, where he laid siege to the castle. Tywin moved his forces east to Harrenhal to intercept Robb Stark and his Northmen, who were marching to King's Landing to free Ned. Based on Robb's age and lack of experience, Tywin thought Robb would charge right into the teeth of his trap, because he couldn't march on King's Landing and leave Tywin behind him, because that would leave his army trapped between the walls of the capital and Tywin's army, similar to what happened to Stannis' forces during the Battle of Blackwater Bay. As it turned out, Ned taught Rob well, and he didn't march into Tywin's trap, and ended up laying one of his own. Rob divided his forces, and sent a faint force towards Harrenhal to draw Tywin out, while leading the bulk of his forces to break the siege of Riverrun, where he won a famous victory, broke the siege, freed Edmure Tully, and captured Jaime. It was not a complete loss for Tywin, however as his defeat of Rob's faint force, led by Roose Bolton, provided Tywin with the means for his eventual victory. It was here that he flipped Roose Bolton, offering him the wardenship of the North in return for Rob's head on a spike. How do we know this? Because soon after his defeat, Roose ordered Helmand Tallhart and Robet Glover to march on Duskendale in Rob's name, which is a tactical disaster and when Rob found out about their terrible defeat there, he was livid, and couldn't understand what could have possibly possessed them to make such a blunder. And Roos pleaded ignorance. As a brief aside, giving command of the faint force to Roos Bolton, Rob's least trustworthy bannerman, was the work of Rob's brilliant self-appointed war counselor, Catalan Tully. Knowing that he couldn't enact the Bolton betrayal until Jamie was free, Tywin withdraws to Harrenhal and orders the Mountain and the Brave Companions to continue reaving the Riverlands, while he attempts to wait out Rob Stark, while also positioning himself so he could march to the aid of King's Landing should Stannis make a move. After learning that Joffrey executed Ned, Tywin decided to send Tyrion to serve as Hand in his stead, and get his idiot sister and insane nephew under control, because trading Ned for Jamie could have ended the hostilities with the Starks, so he could be free to deal with Stannis. Rob then invaded the Westerlands, defeating the army at Oxcross, and pillaged through much of the area, and Tywin is at last forced to act. Needing to defend his homeland to maintain the loyalty of his bannermen, Tywin attempted to cross the Red Fork, but is thrown back several times by Edmir Tully. This actually ended up working in Tywin's favor, because he was able to learn about Stannis' march on King's Landing in time to turn his forces south, link up with the Tyrells, thanks to the Alliance Littlefinger arranged, and save King's Landing from certain defeat, which would have had a devastating effect on House Lannister's position, because Stannis most certainly would have executed Cersei and her twincest bastards, thereby destroying Tywin's lifelong dream of building a dynasty with Lannister blood that sat the Iron Throne. Tywin then assumed the position of Hand, and immediately got to work on unraveling Robb Stark's army from afar. Knowing that the Crag was likely the next Westlands keep that would be taken by Robb Stark, Tywin arranged for Lady Westerling to have her young, attractive daughter tend to Rob while he was there. How exactly they accomplished this without Jane being a part of it, like the app says, is not exactly clear. But what is clear is that Tywin set it up as a means of driving a wedge into Rob's army. 
When Rob returned to River Run from the west, he had a wife with him, causing the Freys to abandon his cause. To make matters worse, Catalan had released Jamie. With Jamie freed, the door was now open for Tywin to set the Bolton betrayal into motion. Now he just needed a time and a place, so he sent a raven to Walder Frey, telling him to pretend to make his peace with Rob, but to demand an immediate marriage to Edmure Tully to seal the deal. He also would have sent a raven to Harrenhal to tell Roos Bolton that his moment had come. The result? The Red Wedding. So we didn't get into the reasons Tywin was willing to loan the crown so much gold, but that will most certainly be discussed in part five. Coming up this week, we will finally be answering some of the questions posted on our Facebook Q&A post and be returning our attention to the little devil and agent of chaos, Littlefinger. But until then, stay tuned, like, and subscribe. For more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.